<laughs> Greetings. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, we welcome all of our participants from around the world. Um, again, please uh, put in the chat box your name, if you're a nurse, um, and where you're joining from. Uh, my name is Constance Newman. I'm the Global Technical Lead for Gender Equality and Health at InterHealth International. I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Nursing Now, the Frontline Health Workers Coalition, and InterHealth International, for bringing together this, this webinar. And let me thank you all for joining part two of our webinar series on gender equality and decent work. In the first webinar, which took place last month, we focused on the definition of decent work, data on unacceptable or indecent work for nurses, um, and on five international labor organization conventions that are helpful for framing uh, issues of gender equality and decent work for nurses. Um, now, to be effective leaders, we believe that nurses need not only an understanding of international health stand international standards, um, that promote and ensure rights at work, but also to have advocacy skills, um, which are uh, the subject of today's um, webinar, uh, which is Nurses for Gender Equality and Decent Work. Now, by the way, let me point out that we chose to hold this webinar during World Health Work Week. Um, Interhealth and the Frontline Health Workers Coalition initiated World Health Worker Week in 2013, and it's become a global movement for advocacy on behalf of health workers. The theme this year is listen to health workers, and that's what we're hoping to do today is to strengthen your advocacy skills, and these skills will lead policymakers to listen to you. Now, I would like to give you some quick background on um, who, uh, for those who are not in the first uh, webinar. The state of the world's nursing shows that 59% of, of uh, health professionals are nurses, and 90% of the world's nurses are women. Um, the, work, the nursing workforce is substantial, and nurse leadership will be essential to ending the COVID epidemic, preventing future disease outbreaks, and achieving universal health coverage. But there's a shortage of nurses globally, and nurses are now choosing to leave the profession. It is estimated that by 2030, there will be a shortage of 6 million nurses. Uh, and the effects of the pandemic suggest that this shortage may grow uh, substantially. Um, so nurses can be the answer to many of the world's health problems, but only if we tackle the persistent barriers that often face and provide nurses, that, that nurses face with providing the materials, protections, and support they need to do their jobs. Those persistent barriers are often gender barriers to decent work. Um, for example, um, th there was a global um, gender and nurse leadership survey um, conducted by Nursing Now Interhealth, and it found that nurses had trouble juggling paid and unpaid work. They faced discrimination on the basis of childbearing status, pregnancy, and family responsibilities. The impediments to nurses assuming leadership roles were stereotyping and a lack of self-confidence, a lack of, of childcare, rigid duty rosters and working hours and work-life conflict. And although nursing is a female dominated profession, 90% of uh, the global nursing survey respondents perceived uh, male, that male nurses benefited from what is called a, a glass escalator into leadership where they carry a male advantage into a female profession while female nurses uh, faced a glass ceiling, an invisible barrier to promotion and leadership in the profession. Um, the evidence base also um, regarding the sexual harassment of nurses um, is growing, um, has been growing, and um, a recent study has found that um, a substantial amount of, of nurses uh, face quid pro quo sexual harassment managers and supervisors, um, and if they, if they uh, refuse, they face administrative retaliation, which has implications uh, for career advancement. Uh, life cycle events like pregnancy are often used to justify passing over a nurse for promotions. These research findings are examples of gender barriers to decent work, unacceptable working conditions. So to retain and to recruit much needed nurses now in the future, governments, 
health policymakers, nurse employers have to take urgent action to take down the gender barriers and other barriers to ensure gender equality and decent work for women, for, for nurses. Nurses like you can use your stories, data, your expertise to influence policymakers and employers to remove these gender barriers. We hope that you will be inspired to get involved in advocacy after today's webinar, and we have a great lineup of speakers. Um, we're gonna hear from Nursing Now, then a panel of four nurses uh, from countries who will share how they've advocated for gender equality and decent work, and then um, a chat with two advocacy experts who are gonna share their own tips and tools for effective advocacy. So now I'd like to turn it over to Barbara Stilwell, who is the Executive Director of Nursing Now. Barbara is my long-term time friend, a collaborator, a former colleague, and a powerful champion for nurses. And she was one of the first nurse practitioners in the United Kingdom. Barbara, over to you. Thanks so much, Candy, and hello to everybody. Um, it's great to have you all with us. I've just been looking at the chat box and we've got people here from the Philippines, Malaysia, Senegal, Kenya, uh, Barbados. So people from all over the world, which is just wonderful. And that's been one of the, one of the great joys of nursing now, has been seeing people from all over, seeing nurses from all over the world able to get together and share experiences and share joys and sorrows during this last year. Uh, we're so thrilled that we're able to work again with Johnson Johnson and um, IntraHealth, uh, who are our, both our long-term partners. And for me, a particular pleasure to work with Candy Newman, who is such a, a fount of knowledge about gender has taught me so much over the years and is still teaching me. So it's a great privilege to be able to be here again with Candy and with all colleagues um, from around the world. As Candy said, this is a, a panel um, of great expertise and experience and uh, I just know you're gonna get a great deal out of this. So it's my job just to recap a little bit on what we've done on the story so far, as they say. Um, this is Nursing Now's season of advocacy. Hashtag nurses together. I hope you're all tweeting like crazy at the moment. Hashtag nurses together. And we're together to see how we can best advocate to get policymakers and the people with the purse strings to invest in nursing. And this particular webinar is about investing in decent work for nurses. <clears throat> I can get my slides to change. Um, which I don't think I can, hang on. Uh, I'm gonna try and share them. Uh, um, so what do we mean by decent work? Ah, okay, great, here we go. Uh, maybe I have to do it again. That's it. Okay. Okay. This is the one I wanted to get to because it's important that we're all understanding the same thing about decent work for nurses. So decent work respects your rights as a person and the rights that you have as a worker. So that means you have to be kept safe. You have to get a fair wage for your job and you have to be supported so that you don't become less healthy physically or mentally by doing your job. Uh, and this is, this is really critical and not always the case for nurses around the world. So let's look at the first one here. Decent work is productive and delivers a fair income. Well, this is um, an interesting one, isn't it? Um, what would be a fair income for nurses? This is a conversation that Candy and I have had with others, thinking about the way in which women's work is often devalued and how nursing work can be seen or said to be women's work because a lot of the tasks that nurses do 
appear to be less than skilled. So washing people, feeding people, all things that family members might do. However, looking at them that way does not acknowledge the complexity of the work that nurses do. And given how complex it is, do we get a fair income? Well, all of us have to look at that, I think, in terms of uh, where we live and, and uh, how our wages compare to others. But I do think um, that it's something we need to be raising our voices about. And we definitely need to be paid on time and regularly, which not all nurses are. We also have to have security in the workplace. And we know from our survey that not all nurses feel safe when they go to work. Some of them are afraid of sexual exploitation, some of physical violence. So we all have to feel secure in our workplace for it to be decent work. And we need to be able to feel we're growing in our job and that we belong where we're working. So that's all about good management as well. And what attempts are made so that the workforce feels managed and feels valued. We need to be able to participate in, work, in workplace decision-making and we need to have equality of opportunity and equality of treatment. And as Candy said, the gender equality conventions at the ILO are, here they are, um, you can see where they are and you can see what numbers they are and you can look them up as well. But the thing about nurses is they often don't look them up. Um, nurses often feel that this is not something they're particularly concerned with. And what we're saying is, this is yours. You need to be advocating for yourself and for your colleagues for decent work. If you go to the Nursing Now website, we have got a uh, toolkit that has a lot of uh, useful um, tools, ways that you can uh, advocate. And what we're asking you to do tomorrow is to put together a letter, which we've shared with you from Nursing Now, uh, and send it to your Minister of Health or Prime Minister at midday. And we want to love you to do this tomorrow and take a picture of yourself doing it. It can be about decent work, it can be about pay, it can be about any of these things, but make your voice heard together, nurses together, because unless we learn to be better at this, things are not going to change. So that's why we're so excited to be joining this webinar to have the opportunity uh, to hear from all of these speakers about what we can do, all of us together, on advocacy about decent work. So David, Bryden, I'm handing over to you and to the panel. Thank you, Barbara. It's great to be here with everyone. and. Uh, Hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, uh, great. So uh, wonderful to be here with everyone. I'm David Bryden with the Frontline Health Workers Coalition. And it's just an honor and a privilege to be with uh, Barbara and Candy and, and all the terrific nurses that we have on the panel coming to you now. Uh, so I, I just really want you to stay tuned. Uh, this is, uh, we're, we're going uh, for uh, you know quite a number of minutes here uh, as we go through the panel, I want you to stay to the end because what, what's going to happen after the panel, we've got some important polling questions that we're going to ask you. We've got a conversation with an advocacy expert from Kenya, uh, who I really am eager for you to meet uh, and get a sense of what she's been doing when it comes to engagement with the, uh, the parliament. Barbara already highlighted a couple of critical tools, the advocacy toolkit, be sure to check that out online as well as the letter. And we're gonna come back to that again at the very end. So, so stay tuned. You also see that chat button. Uh, please get active in that chat, share your opinions, share your questions. And also on the reactions button. Does everyone see the reactions button? Let me see some thumbs up. Let me see some confetti. Let's get some reactions going here. Let's make this a lively space, even though we're in the, the land, of, uh, land of Zoom. 
Okay, so let's get started with our panel. So we're really lucky to have four nurses from different countries today who are gonna share with us how they've advocated for gender equality and decent work, which is every nurse's right, as Barbara was just saying. So these nurses represent different levels of nursing positions, uh, from a new nurse to a former minister of health. So I'm gonna just uh, quickly uh, introduce some of these, this uh, tremendous panel. Uh, to you. And, uh, you know, we're just really lucky. We're going to start out with Zipporah Regi, who's a, a young nurse currently working as a nurse intern uh, in uh, Kitui uh, County Referral Hospital. She's the first vice, uh, vice chairperson of the Kenya Students and Novice Nurses, which is a chapter of National Nurses Association of Kenya. Uh, so she's coming up. She's, uh, she's already uh, played a major role in mentoring nursing students. Uh, and uh, unifying their voice. Then we've got Professor Sheila Tlu. Uh, Sheila Tlu, you've, I think, maybe heard from on other webinars, and she's just a dynamic speaker. So you're going to love hearing from, from uh, Dr., um, Dr. Uh, Professor Tlu in just a moment. Uh, she's actually made the list of the 100 most influential women in Africa, uh, co-chair of the Global HIV Prevention Coalition and co-chair of Nursing Now's Global Campaign. Uh, I'm going to come back to her bio uh, later. Then we've got Leticia Bernuez uh, from Nursing Now Madrid. So we're very happy to have Leticia here from Spain. Uh, so very excited uh, that she's uh, here. She's a representative of Nursing Now Madrid and been advocating uh, uh, now for uh, nurse, better nursing uh, conditions, working conditions. And then lastly, Lelem Besa, uh, who is a nurse practitioner, assistant professor. Uh, she's a, a tremendous level of experience in clinical work, teaching, research, and mentoring. Okay, so we've got an amazing panel. So, so let's just, let's dive right in. So Zipporah, I'm gonna to turn to you now. So you're a young nurse. Uh, you've been working as a nurse intern. You've been bringing together nursing uh, students uh, and mentoring them. Tell us about uh, your experience and, uh, and what got you engaged in this uh, important campaign for decent work and justice for the nurses there. Um, thank you very much, David. It's an honor to be here, and I hope that you can all hear me well. Um, so Carol is just sharing a few photos of me um, in a session we had with young students from one of the institutions in Kenya, um, and I was one of the mentors who was speaking to them to, um, on that day. Um, and we also had a session with their faculty members um, in one of their offices just to engage on how we can make nursing students more empowered um, in light of um, advocacy um, and highlighting and fighting for nurses' needs. Um, I think my journey began back when I was a student in school. Um, when I got to Fobi, I got an opportunity to attend a conference uh, organized by medical and pharmacy students. Um, and they were just sharing the experiences of how they have been able to do so much when they are so young. Um, and I was studying in a school in the rural area, so we never had a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, so I think I always got bothered by the status quo, you know, we had leaders in the Students Association who were not um, really doing much for us. Um, they were just showing up when um, lecturers calls for meeting or when there was an event and all that. Um, and so when I realized that there's an opportunity and there's so much potential for young people to do more, even uh, from a student's uh, perspective, then I got to join um, the group from the city now who were already engaged in advocacy. Um, and I think what we did was approach the National Nurses Association of Kenya. And I think um, Howard Cotton, the CEO, of ICN is always insistent on you know going through the National Nurses Association as our allies um, and I think because they already had um, a chapter that was designated for young nursing students and um, young nurses who are under five years of experience we decided to use that um, as our channel for advocacy and all that and even to bring together young student nurses and I think from there um, we got now connected to many people we got connections to the union we got connections to the regulatory body Body, um, that is the Nursing Council of Kenya. Um, and we were also able to approach different nurse educators and just engage students in their institutions to see how we can mentor them and empower them even in this journey of them being molded to be nurse leaders and health leaders um, in light of building a better future for health and nursing in general. Thank you, David. 
Thanks for that uh, terrific summary of all the great work that you've been doing in Kenya uh, as, a, as a young nurse. And I just think it's really inspiring. I hope everyone in the audience is taking notes because really uh, Zipporah has really weighed in and, and brought this voice to, to a real strong uh, level in, in Kenya, working with all of her colleagues. So uh, Zipporah, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. So as you look at the current situation there in, in, uh, in Kenya, how have you seen uh, the, uh, the impact of advocacy so far? You talked about how you've brought that voice of the students forward uh, yeah. and, and, and worked in, the, in mentoring. Uh, have you seen some, uh, some, some incremental progress uh, at, as you've been bringing this advocacy voice forward? Um, yes, I think there have been steps that we have moved forward. Um, in the beginning, it was really hard because um, there was not that channel way for students to use to present their issues. Um, and also young nurses under five years of experience. But I think over time, because of the connections that we had made and the platforms that we gave for young nurses to grow, uh, both in their careers professionally and also in leadership, then we have been able to get a greater voice. Um, and so we have been able to have sessions with leaders, um, even including the Director of Nursing Services at the national level. We have also been able to have sitting um, with the board members of the regulatory body. We have been able to have a sitting with the president of the National Nurses Association. And I think just having that collective voice, having that community, um, and also using social media as our greatest platform for advocacy. Um, I think a while back when we were still lobbying for better pay and on-time payments for um, nurses, then we as young nurses had our hashtag, you know, pay the interns because we are also falling prey um, to the um, lack of payment, uh, on-time payment rather. Um, and I think now through that, we have also been able to learn um, with the mentors that we have been having, the leaders that we have been working with. And I think that generally now we are able to just have conversations with them um, when you don't do an outreach program or a mentorship program, then having the leaders by our side has, been, has made the work very easy. And I think now we are continuing to make further and further strides to increase our following. Right now we have been doing a project where we want to reach um, most of the majority um, institutions in Kenya, just to increase the following in the community um, and see how that how we can increase that platform um, to be more inclusive um, and more um, um, and build more opportunities for young nurses to do the same. Yes. It's great. It's really wonderful to have you uh, lead off the, the presentations today because really the, the spirit of activism you're bringing into this work is just so inspiring. Can you say just a, a few words about the strike that was recently uh, uh, that the Kenyan nurses recently uh, carried out, and and have you seen any uh, any outcome from that uh, struggle? Um, yeah, just a bit of a background. We had a 79 day strike that ended on February 25th, began I think the first week of December, um, where we were lobbying for better on time payment. We had like some counties who had not been paid for over 14 months. Um, others had not been paid for over six months um, and they were still expected to go to work every day. Um, I think also we were lobbying for uh, PPEs. We have not had a lot of them being provided for frontline healthcare workers uh, in the hospitals. And I think that was a major issues. Um, we also had, um, we were also lobbying for nurses who had passed on in their line of duty due to COVID. Um, and a lot of them did so having not been paid for a very long time and the burden of medical bills would fall on their families and it became very tough for those particular families. Um, I think during the strike, there was a lot of um, resistance, particularly from the parliament. Um, and then as Barbara shared, um, you know, us being referred to as semi-skilled people uh, that came out very strongly. Um, we had some leaders actually voice that um, over the television. Um, and then we had others who were also evicted from their government in their, um, provid provided homes due to the strike, where the county governments um, just decided to rid them of their homes um, in light of trying to motivate them to get back to work, um, even without getting paid. As of yet, but I think um, the National Union of Nurses and the National Nurses Association of Kenya are working very hand in hand to have conversations with the parliament. Um, and I think when the strike ended, um, the court was able to order every county government to give payments to all nurses, all that all payments that were due to them. Um, and those who had been evicted from their homes uh, were 
were told that they can go back to their homes. Um, and I think even after that, there have been talks with the government to see how we can make a sustainable plan so that that does not happen. I think in Kenya from 2010 to around 2016, we had a whole six uh, national wide strikes. Um, and that has just been going on for a very, very long time. So I think um, as of the moment, the union and the National Nazis Association of Kenya are continuing to uh, make those connections with the parliament and other leaders just to see how we can make uh, decent work, a better on time payment, a regular thing uh, for all nurses and healthcare workers in Kenya. Yes. Thank you very much. So it's clear some gains have been made, but, but yeah. there's a lot more that needs to really bring about justice and decent work for, for the nurses and all medical uh, professionals there. Thank you so much, Zipporah. We'll come back to you a little bit later, but now I wanna to turn to uh, Sh Professor Sheila Tlu. Uh, Professor Sheila Tlu, as I was saying earlier, is one of the 100 most influential women in Africa. Uh, she's the co-chair of the HIV Prevention Coalition uh, Nursing Now Global Campaign. Uh, she was the director from 2010 to 2017 of the UNAIDS Regional Support Team for Eastern and Southern Africa, and is a former member of parliament. We've been hearing about parliament just a moment ago. She's a former member of parliament and a minister of health uh, in the Republic of Botswana from 2004 to 2009. So it's a real honor to have you here, uh, Dr. Clu. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. Um, and uh, Zapora, I have to just say that was very good activism. We need more of you. Um, well, let me say greetings. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And it's really great to have you. Let me start by passing my greetings uh, from uh, my co-chair of Nissin Now, Lord Nigel Crisp, who is in, uh, in, in London and sending his greetings. So um, my thing, let me, I, I won't go, we have only five minutes, so I won't go into a lot of details, but to simply say that for me, gender activism, started when I was a young girl because uh, I was really taught by a great father who was one of the, the first feminists that I knew of. He passed away about uh, two, two years ago at the age of 94. And it's interesting that sometimes when I'm reading something, I, I wonder I wonder what he would say. My mother is still alive at the age of 94 too, but she wasn't that much of a gender activist. I think she left it to him to do all the things. So it's a long story, but if I'm asked, I'll say some of the instances where he helped me even to stop child marriages and all that. So, so that, that's where my activism uh, started. So um, let me have the, the, the next slide. Uh, to say that in the later years then, I became a gender and AIDS activist uh, from 1985 when HIV started in Botswana. And at that time I was at the University of Botswana we were noticing that uh, women were having a, a hard time juggling paid and unpaid work. And the great part was that already the equal pay you know, for equal work and also the maternity protection were already there throughout the country. So we didn't have to struggle with that one. But in terms of progression and really you know, that being a hindrance was there. So we formed what we called the Gender Policy and Program Committee and I became chair of that. But the first thing we had to do, as we say, evidence is always better. We knew that if we were going to do any ad advocacy, we had to produce evidence. So we did collaborative research in all the faculties with all the other faculty members. And we, you know, we produced data on gender issues at UB, which at University of Botswana, which resulted in, of course, daycare facilities for children or staff members within the university. So we saw more women being promoted to senior lectureship and indeed professorship, because now they had, they did not have to worry about where their children were. They could bring them in the morning and take them after, uh, after work. We then developed a university policy on HIV and AIDS. Remember at that time, we were very much affected by HIV and AIDS. And we also developed a university policy on sexual harassment. Um, then I became specially elected member of parliament and minister of health in 2004. Uh, I went, let me have the next slide. I went on to government and it was interesting that when I got there, there were no policies on, in the public sector on, on, on gender issues. And when I inquired, it was more like, yeah, but we have the constitution of Botswana is the best constitution, we follow it. And I thought, no, 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 this won't do. 
and there was already evidence of harassment at the workplace. During that time, this was a time of the brain drain. And remember when I became minister, really more than 90% of my workforce was really uh, nurses. They were the ones we, we relied on. We had very few medical doctors. In fact, the medical school was started by me. So you can imagine, but a lot of people knew that if you married a nurse, your chances of going overseas and getting a better life and, you know, uh, and even going to school are better. So nurses were harassed by everybody, you know, from their colleagues to relatives to every, so that I, you know, we, we then had to really just say, we are going to have a policy on, uh, on sexual harassment, but we, we made it within the wellness center because what we also figured was uh, we, we, we were able to do a survey which showed that nurses and or health personnel were, were actually reluctant to go for HIV testing because of that stigma of where somebody becomes positive and you are told, well, you ought to have known better. You know, you are a health professional. So we decided, okay, we are going to have wellness centers for health personnel where you can go, whether it's a broken foot or a broken toe or HIV testing, then you go there. And that really helped to decrease. But within that, then we put in the policy, just adopted the sexual harassment policy and with education materials at all facilities. So that for the first time people were seeing posters where it was like, you know, uh, violence will not be tolerated or harassment of any kind will not be tolerated. So, you know, we saw reductions in stigma and harassment, but, but really reduct more reductions because for me being an AIDS activist, what I saw more were reductions in, you know, uh, the stigma or sometimes even the self-stigmatization of health personnel. They were able to, 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 to go for testing and also access ARVs if they were, um, you know, if they were infected. Because one of the things we were actually losing nurses to HIV and some were reluctant to go for testing because of that stigma and discrimination. So that was really great. Now in my conclusion, the next last slide is ready to say that as activists, we need evidence you know, we need strategic information if we are going to really act to integrate human rights and gender issues in the workplace. And most important, we need the key areas, including supportive legislation and policies. But we also need monitoring and evaluation for sustainability, because some of the things that I did when I left, since they were not part and parcel of legislation, they actually fell by the wayside. So, so that, you know, harassment is still there. In fact, um, a year ago, we actually had a nurse raped. I mean, that has never happened in the history of our country. So it was a shock, but then it really shows that the work, you know, the workplace environment is not as protective as it can, it should be. So with that, let me stop there and I'll ask some, uh, ask some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tlu. It's, it's been really important to hear about your experience over these many, years and, and really the uh, innovation that you brought to bear uh, in your, your time in office and, and since then, the, the work that you've done. Um, as I look at your uh, experience, I, I wanted to ask one particular question. If you were in a country that did not have such progressive legislation as Botswana, where would you start uh, in trying to uh, interest the uh, government in passing laws uh, to make sexual harassment illegal, or another aspect of, of decent work, uh, irregular pay, or uh, 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 poor uh, sanitation in the hospital facilities. If you're a nurse and you see a problem, where do you start in terms of trying to influence uh, parliament and, and government? Where, what's, the, what's, the, what's the best way to, to get that going? Yes, well, the problem in a lot of countries, including Botswana, is that in parliament is mostly men. So even the mention of sexual harassment, they start saying to you, what do you mean? What is sexual harassment? You know, so, so that uh, it, it's really then to be able to do research, a survey or whatever, to convince them that it is harassment when this happened. We had the same problem at university. I mean, it wasn't as simple as I, uh, you know, I, I made it sound. Uh, you know, men and women, in academia, even students, and their own, had their own definitions of harassment, where 
uh, females saw it as you know unwelcome touching and you know suggestions and you know even the sexual exploitation and all. men could some students were actually saying it is sexual harassment if a lecturer falls in love with a student because that student should have been mine you know I, i'm the one who should have uh, you know been dating her but because the lecturer is more important. So to them, it was harassment. So we had to really do a lot of education. And indeed, it starts with that, but we need to therefore be able to have that evidence to say, look, a lot of things are not happening the way they should be. Here is the evidence. And we start from there. I mean, in short, you know, evidence hits you in the face and you cannot ignore it. But in the ultimate, I, you know, if anybody asks me, I really would say we need the porous in parliament. Because in the ultimate, as long as it's a male dominated environment, it, it takes a lot to be able to change it. I did my bit, but half the time I had to be not so nice. So, so it really was that. Yeah, thank you. Audience, you're hearing it right from Dr. Tzu. Political engagement, run for office. Yes. Uh, that's part of the solution to this. Get engaged, get engaged and, and find, your, find your allies. Uh, so this has been a really important conversation. I know we'll have time to come back a little bit later. So I'm going to pass the the uh, uh, the baton now to uh, our nurse who's with us from Spain, uh, Leticia Bernuez, uh, nursing now uh, Madrid, uh, who's been uh, using advocacy strategies to put in place maternity protection uh, and uh, and really open opportunities for nurse leadership uh, and engaging with polit politicians. Uh, on uh, the creation of a, a government commission to look at the quality of care. Uh, so uh, Leticia, I'm gonna turn the, uh, the floor over to you. So, hello. Hi. Yes, hear you. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here today with this great panel. So I'm a member of the local group Nursing of Madrid, that is being said. We are a small group of nursing now, set up in 2019 by the Madrid Nursing Association. Other nursing associations and nurses willing to make a change in nursing and in the healthcare system. We have been advocating for nursing since the beginning, talking with politicians from Madrid and even from the Ministry of Health of Spain. But unfortunately, we have to stop all our plans with the COVID-19. But still, we took a little bit of time last year to do a survey to know how nurses are living the pandemic, how it feels to be a nurse in Spain, and what they are they expecting for the future. With the data of this survey, the objective and report of nursing now and the strategy directions for nursing at my wife, we have set up our priorities of work for the future, like developing the nurses specialities, more leadership opportunities, or better work-life balance. And in the following weeks, we will be having meetings with politicians to start to work, work with them again. One of our main objectives will be to achieve decent work conditions for nurses, because we think it is essential to achieve all other objectives. As while nurses are trapped in this system of indecent work, they can't afford the time to think in how to improve their conditions, their career, or the quality of their care. And in a profession made up mostly by women, fighting for decent work is fighting for gender equality. Because as nurses, we suffer many of the gender stereotypes that affect women. As for example, we are considered as subordinate to others, not being as scientific professions or being seen as an angels, but not as leaders. So to be able to develop our professions, we need to break these stereotypes and we need to break also the glass ceiling that keep us away from the leadership positions. And that is usually related to the women stereotypes and also to the domestic and family responsibilities that normally are assumed by women. And to achieve all this, we need politicians to help us. So we have to show them the value of the knowledge of nurses and how to invest in nurses is investing in people's health. The pandemic has exposed many problems of the health system, and we are going to have to rebuild and redesign it if we don't want them to happen again. But to do this successfully, nurses are essential, not only because we are about the 50% of the healthcare professionals, and it will be impossible to fix the healthcare system without listening to the half of the professionals, but also because we have the right knowledge to address many of the challenges that we are facing as a society. 
We can play a leading role in making the change that the healthcare system needs to improve people's health. But for that, we need to have a seat on the table where decisions are made. There are already a lot of evidence about how investing in nurses and improving their working conditions can improve patients' results and global health, but it doesn't seem to reach our politicians and decision makers. That's why we need to learn how to communicate this evidence to them and how to advocate for nurses. We are already used to do that in the clinical area for our patients, so we just need to learn how to do this in the political area. And for that, let me share with you some advice that I have learned with, during the national campaign. First, find a team you feel comfortable working with. This is a very important point because advocacy can be hard and frustrating sometimes, but with the right team, things are always better. I recommend to work with an organization or a nursing association because there is usually easier to find people that are willing to work to make a change and also because they usually have already many contacts that are another important thing to advocate. You need to know the right people. Also use the data and reports, especially the ones from recognized international organizations because that will validate your proposals and will make your arguments sound stronger. And when you get a meeting with a politician or a decision maker, it's very useful to investigate about them, read their interviews or the political program to know what they want and how fit their priorities were yours. So they can see how helping you will help them to achieve their objectives. Listen and learn from people who have experience advocating and use all the toolkits available for that as the one from nurses now together, from nurses together, sorry, that can help you to organize your ideas and make a start. And finally, just be persistent. You have your evidence, you know what you're doing and you know why you're doing it. So just go, do, go for it. Don't let anyone to put you down. And now if I can share just my screen, I would like to share some pictures. This is from the first event that we did as nurses now. We organized a debate with politicians. You can see there the politicians taking note about uh, our problems and our proposals. And here is the room with a lot of nurses that's listening and just taking part of this advocacy event. I think it's a good example for advocacy. Okay, hey, thank you, Leticia. Inspiring. It's great to hear about. It's great to hear about all the work that you've been doing, and uh, to really get a sense of the steps that you followed and and those really important tips. You know, one of the things that you mentioned that I think is really important is to, not to try to do this alone, uh, to really work with others, to find people that will will work with you, uh, to go to your nursing association. Uh, to really find your allies. To me, that's one of the most important lessons from this entire webinar is to find your allies and strategize together uh, to find those who really can deliver on what you need to get decent work and get your rights respected. So I just think this is, this is really great to hear. As you uh, uh, reflect on some of the experiences uh, that we've heard about from other uh, countries, do you think, um, Letizia, that some of the uh, steps that you've taken can be applied in, in other settings, uh, like in, in Kenya, for instance, or, or in other countries? Yeah, I think so. We, we don't nothing special, so it can be shared by any country, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, uh, you mentioned that it can be frustrating at times, what are some of the frustrations that you experienced? And how did, how did you get... So, for example, a few years ago, as, as you mentioned, the commission that we, we were planning with a political party, we were talking with the political party about that commission to improve the quality of care by improving the working conditions of the healthcare professionals. And we were about to start, and suddenly the government of here in Madrid just blew up. And the, we have elections again, so everything is stopped, and we had to restart and replan everything that we were doing because now we don't have a government and we don't know what is going to happen after. So that is a stop that's a little bit frustrating, but also we are having now elections. And I think this is a good time also for 
to get uh, politicians to listen to us because they are in a political campaign. So it's, it's always a good time. We're trying to take advantage on that. Okay. Uh, and I've just got another question for you. As you look at the advocacy uh, that you've been doing, and I, I want to ask this question in, in uh, for the uh, benefit in part to the men who have, have tuned in. Uh, so as you look at uh, engaging with men in, in, uh, and in, the, in the struggle for decent work and better conditions, are there any, any tips that you could share um, about uh, what's the best way for male nurses and, and other men who are on the call right now to be a good ally? to you in your work and, and in your struggle? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is to listen to the woman and listen to women nurses when they complain about discrimination because sometimes men cannot see it as we do. So I think that when we are complaining about uh, gender discrimination, I think it's very important for them to listen to us and to believe us, even if they cannot see it. Because obviously, yeah. if there is a lot of women saying that there is a discrimination there, it's because of something. I think that's a really important point that uh, that men need to listen and tend to really uh, uh, open their minds to this uh, and uh, and really uh, it, and take a step back. Uh, we've had some tremendous leadership already on this call uh, from women, and uh, and it's really it's an opportunity for. For men to uh, to to let women take the lead on on these issues and uh, and to really contribute and be a good ally. Yeah. So uh, so I really thank you for your presentation uh, today. So I'm gonna uh, we'll come back with some additional questions directed to you a bit later. But now I'm gonna pass the uh, the word to uh, our nurse uh, practitioner who's here from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, Lem Lem Besa is here with us. She's an assistant professor and unit head of, the, of emergency and critical care nursing. Uh, and uh, she's been doing clinical work, teaching, research and mentoring nursing students in clinical offices uh, for over 10 years. She has a tremendous amount of experience to share. Uh, Lem Lem, I'm gonna turn the, uh, the word over to you. Lemlem, can you uh, can you hear us? Are you are you tuned in? I can't tell if we've lost uh, if we've lost uh, if lost our audio. Okay, looks like she looks like she's lost her connection. So I'm sure she'll tune back in once she is able to. Uh, but once she's able to reconnect. Okay, so we've had a couple of really fascinating presentations. Um, and so I've got a couple of things I wanna do now to just kind of bring out your views. What are your, tell us about yourself. I've got some polling questions that I wanna to pose to you uh, as you've been uh, engaging and listening so far. Tell us about your experience uh, as, uh, as you uh, have been engaging in this. Can we roll those uh, polling questions, please? There you go, there's poll number one. What type of advocacy have you been involved in? Click all that apply. All right. So do, do participate in our poll. Once we have the uh, polling results, we'll share them with everyone to get, get a sense. Tell us about what you've been doing. Have you been participating in the mass lobby, sending letters, holding meetings with elected officials or the Ministry of Health, uh, posting calls uh, uh, to, to, on social media? Have you been writing opinion pieces in your newspaper? Have you, been, uh, have you not been involved in advocacy yet? Tell us about what you've been doing.
Great. Okay. Thank you so much. So thanks for that uh, participating in our poll. So we'll have uh, we'll have the results uh, for you shortly. But I think Lemlem is back with us. Oh, there's the results. Okay. So we've got the results. It looks like the uh, highest participation. Well, there's quite a lot of participation in advocacy, and social media gets the highest. I see that's uh, something that Zipporah was recommending earlier, and that's really uh, fascinating to see. Participating in the mass lobby. 39% uh, of those who have uh, responded to our poll. Thank you so much for, uh, for participating in the poll. We're gonna have another polling question for you uh, very shortly. Okay, so if I can open the floor to Lem Lem, are you with us again? Give me just one minute to convert her to a presenter. She's in as an attendee. Hello. Okay. Lemla, it sounds like you're with us again. Yes. Good. Okay. Well, I know our our, our tech expert here, Jeffrey, is is uh, lining up your uh, lining up your presentation. Are we are we ready to go? Hello. Yes, we're good to go. Okay, all right, thank you. Lem Lem, I'm turning the floor to you now. Tell us about your experience in Ethiopia and do you have any reflections on what you've, you've heard so far? Over yeah, to you. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for participating in this wonderful uh, webinar. I'm very excited to hear from different experts from different worlds. So yeah, uh, as it has been said, uh, I'm Lem Lem, a nurse, uh, emergency and critical care nurse practitioner working from rural to tertiary hospital, uh, currently working in the largest hospital uh, uh, at Sababa University and tertiary hospital, uh, Black Line Hos uh, Hospital. And I, I, as it has been said, I am doing uh, research, uh, teaching, coaching, and clinical work. And I have also a great engagement in advocating for nurses. Um, I just feel like I am, I'm, our nurses are in a different world. Uh, we don't have uh, nurses here are not standing out for their right and duties. And um, uh, I think the problem uh, we have heard from different nurses is the same here. So uh, taking that into consideration, currently I have, uh, I'm, I'm working with the um, health minister in relation to um, the development or establishment of a nursing council. Uh, in Ethiopia, which we don't have uh, uh, now, but the, the nursing in Ethiopia is, uh, have a, a very old history. Uh, it is uh, 19th, in 1915, uh, since the establishment or the development of nursing in, in Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, just the problem is the same here, but I, I feel it is worse. I have a chance to visit different countries like I, I I've been able to visit um, a high resource setting like US, Emory, and Michigan, and also Africa, uh, Kenya, and Tanzania. Uh, the, the nursing practice in Ethiopia is quite, quite different. Um, and just from, from the little, we don't have a scope of practice, a well delineated scope of practice and regulatory body for nurses. Uh, so uh, that is a huge, a huge uh, problem here. And uh, uh, it, it might be frustrating to work in a different level, nursing practice to practice nursing here in Ethiopia in a different level. Being bit, you are a diploma nurse or a certificate nurse or a higher level uh, BSc nurse and master's nurse. As long as you don't have a scope of practice, it will be frustrating. You will be engaged in a very routine, uh, skill based kind of uh, doesn't take uh, high. Uh, evidence-based knowledge and things like that. So that makes me, makes me frustrating and having the opportunity to visit different countries make me uh, to just advocate for the development of nursing in Ethiopia. So uh, currently I'm working on the, towards the establishment of um, this council. Uh, so one of the, the reason is um, uh, lack of clear uh, scope of practice is uh, one of the frustrating. Uh, probably you might, the, the scope of pra practice might be delineated by the physician working with you, like uh, do this and do that, that is it. So that makes me like um, 
frustrated uh, to practice as a nurse. So I'm the I'm, I will be I, I am the first um, graduate in emergency and critical care at master's level in Ethiopia, and I will be the first uh, female nurse uh, having PhD in nursing in Ethiopia, uh, which is which is also a surprise. So you see development in nursing education is also very, very low because of lack of this uh, council. Uh, the curriculum will be developed by anybody, any specialty, especially physician. Uh, if they have a specialty, they turn, they will develop curriculum in specialty nursing. If they have some specialties, they, want, they tend to develop a subspecialty nursing uh, by their own because there is no any, any kind of um, regulation or regulatory body that just to say no. Uh, and you may see sometimes a school of nursing will be led by uh, by a physician or other as other professional. That is also a frustration. So uh, thank you to Emery Nursing. Uh, I now currently at the verge to establish the the council. Uh, I have a chance to visit uh, Kenya to see how the Council working, and um, uh, just the moment I came back from Kenya, what I did is I established a tax force that uh, that uh, have a composition of different professionals. One is a nursing association uh, uh, vice chair. The, 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 this uh, tax force is chaired by uh, the the nursing um, association council, the nursing society president. Uh, so uh, this time uh, uh, we are uh, developing the proclamation. The proclamation is at the at its final stage and uh, currently submitted uh, to uh, to the House of Representatives for for final approval. Um, and um, different forums were were uh, were set for the stakeholders to I mean. To know what council is, what works for the nurses. This council, not only for the nurses, for other professionals as well. Regulation is is, is not here. Uh, we can say non-existent regulation of professional here. Uh, that might worse in uh, nursing. Uh, so um, yeah, nurses are not involved in any kind of leadership position in um, either in uh, college uh, or either in there. There is no any even political uh, commitment for nurses and there is no support and uh, nurses are frontline frontliners uh, even in covid response uh, nurses are frontliners they are not properly paid as uh, they don't uh, as i have mentioned earlier they don't stand out for their right uh, just to just fight and and they are not well paid uh, i'm a teacher in uh, in the university uh, i have uh, a postgraduate nurses and they have a duty, the night duty, day duty, but they are not paid. Just like a physician, as as a resident physician, have a payment, a duty payment. Uh, our uh, masters emergency nurses are not paid, but they have a, a duty schedule, night duty schedule. So this all are makes me uh, frustrated to uh, to practice even with the higher level uh, after. I will be graduated uh, after a month, but I don't know what will be my position. It will be the same as the previous um, uh, position I have. So that is also a uh, frustration for me. So I'm very happy uh, we are in, in, in the right track. Uh, we have a, uh, also a consultant from Kenya uh, to make it practical this council and um, yeah, uh, these are some of uh, some of my major job uh, currently that I uh, shout uh, day and the night to make it uh, in the ground. Thank you so much, uh, Lemons. It's really fascinating experience. You've really been going at this issue from all different sides. The scope of practice, uh, getting the respect uh, for the level of education and and preparation that nurses have already put in uh, and uh, that, that, that being a foundation of, of decent work. So I think that that's really critical. We had an interesting question that uh, came in uh, from, uh, from one of our colleagues uh, on the chat 
Uh, do you think that uh, the new profile of healthcare workers might improve the work environment in terms of gender equity and uh, decent work? And I believe she's referring to uh, the it previously, most medical students were men, uh, but now most of the uh, medical students are women. Do you believe that as women enter the uh, workforce as, as physicians, that that will improve the, uh, the working uh, conditions for nurses as well? I believe, I believe uh, the, this might, you know, obviously um, nurses are less paid, whether they are at higher level or lower level. There, there is, um, in my country, um, uh, the nurses are treated differently as compared to the other, the physician. We are comparing because we are working together with physician. When we see the duty payment, the work environment, the conduciveness, uh, um, the right and making a leader leadership position is is compromised. I, I can I can say that there are, nurses are not in 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 that they are not the the the, the first liners to be a leader in in my setup. So um, coming to the payment, it's the low pay, low paid uh, in every aspect in, in duty or in what in whatever context. So. Uh, I believe that if there is a clear rules and regulation for the nurse to be ma to be guided or to be uh, to be uh, managed, uh, I believe that there will be a very nice conducive environment to be well paid uh, to, to 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 get what they deserve. Yeah, thank you. And it it sounds like from your experience that you've been engaging with politicians successfully. You mentioned Parliament taking up the proposals that you have made. How have you been able to do that? In, in some countries, one of our uh, participants in the chat expresses frustration that the politicians don't seem to listen. How, how have you, have you uh, addressed the, the, uh, the Parliament in your country? Oh, uh, the, the issue is uh, the, this council is going, to be, is going to be established not by directive. We, we were fighting against that. We want this council to be established by legislation or proclamation. So that proclamation or legislation has to get the final approval from the House of Representatives. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a politician. I don't have any position on, on that sec. But the ministry, our Minister of Health have a, 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 a good, a, is, is, it has a positive, um, a positive push for us, uh, for the development of that council. So, uh, so for the proclamation to be approved, it has to go to the House of Representatives. I'm not a politician. I don't have any position in that. <laughs> okay, but that's really interesting though, that you feel that the Minister of Health is supportive of some positive change in your country. Uh, yes. So that, that's, that's, really, that's really important. Uh, so that, that's really good to hear. So thank you so much uh, for sharing your uh, experience. Uh, you know, we'll be uh, sharing uh, you know, more information about what you've been doing uh, in the follow-up to the, uh, the webinar. So thank you uh, so much. So I'm gonna uh, shift gears a little bit here now. Uh, you've heard uh, from a couple of fantastic panelists. Uh, you've heard from a uh, nurse in, in Spain. You've heard from a nurse in, in Kenya. You've heard the former Minister of Health from Botswana, and you just heard a, a nursing expert uh, and real leader in her country in, in Ethiopia. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit here. I wanna start out though, uh, by uh, asking you another poll question. So if Jeffrey, if you could load up the second poll, we're gonna ask uh, uh, you some, some questions here. Okay, poll number two. So as you look at, gender equality, which of the following issues uh, for nurses do you think are the most important to address via advocacy? What are the most important to you? That first one is adequate maternal, maternity protection, medical leave, health and financial benefits, breastfeeding and employment security. Or number two, balancing work and family work and discrimination based on family responsibilities. 
Is that an important issue for you with gender equality and decent work? Number three, fair pay and receiving wages on time. Number four, infection prevention and control, COVID related or not. The fifth one there, violence, harassment, or stigma, sexual or gender harassment. Uh, number six, sexual or gender harassment. Number seven, stereotyping of nurses. Uh, Letizia uh, mentioned that in her presentation. And then that last one is the scope of practice that Lem Lem from Ethiopia was just addressing. So of these, uh, of these items that relate to gender equality and decent work for nurses, which do, do you think are the most important for uh, addressing through advocacy? So again, the choices, maternal, maternity protection, including medical leave, health and financial benefits, breastfeeding and employment, security. And the second one, balancing work and family work and discrimination based on family responsibilities, fair pay and receiving wages on time, infection prevention and control, COVID related or not, violence, harassment or stigma, sexual or gender harassment, stereotyping of nurses, and the last one is the nursing scope of practice. Which are, do you think are the most important issues to take into the advocacy arena, to take to the politicians, to take to the uh, Ministry of Health, to take to the head of your hospital or clinic? Okay, so we've got some, we've got some results here. So we've got uh, a number of people have responded, looks like about uh, 20 or so responded to our poll. And by far, uh, the biggest one is fair pay and receiving wages on time. So that's really, uh, that's really interesting to see. Looks like I did miss a few, one at the a few options at the bottom. The glass ceiling and career development are also options. So that's fascinating uh, that uh, the top one is fair pay and receiving wages on time. Uh, that sounds like a top issue for the Ministry of Health uh, and for Parliament uh, to be addressing, as well as other uh, levels of government. But coming in uh, second though, is that one at the top, which is adequate maternity protection, including medical leave, health and financial benefits, breastfeeding and employment security. So maternity protection, is coming in second in this poll. Coming in third is violence, harassment, or stigma. I know that there's been quite a wave of violence, in fact, over the last year associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and that's been well documented. So that's a really critical issue uh, for advocacy. Thanks for taking part in our poll. So now we're going to uh, turn to another uh, fascinating guest that, that we have, uh, who's really brings a lot of advocacy experience as, uh, as we've looked at infectious disease, particularly HIV uh, and TB, uh, but even uh, beyond that. So I'm going to open the floor now uh, to our guest uh, from Kenya, Rahab Wanaki. She's the advocacy manager at, at Kanko, which is a leading organization in Kenya. And I've known Rahab uh, for a number of years. I've had the pleasure of working with her on a number of campaigns related to tuberculosis. Uh, she's the uh, campaigns manager at Kanko, engaging with communities and decision makers at national, regional, and global levels. Uh, she also has experience working with people living with HIV networks in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania generate the evidence for advocacy, engage in high level advocacy with policymakers and legislators uh, on HIV, TB and nutrition issues. So what we're gonna hear from Rahab is what about her work and how it could apply to the issues that nurses have been raising during this discussion. All right, turning the floor over now to Rahab, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for a very good uh, introduction. I hope I'm audible. 
Yes, indeed. Thank you. So I think I want to appreciate uh, what the NAS advocates have really brought out in this, um, in this webinar on how we need actually to advocate for the welfare of our nurses. And because of living in a low middle income country, I appreciate the fact that nurses are our frontline healthcare worker. If I go to my facility where I live, I will not most likely get a doctor, but I'll get a nurse or a clinical officer. And these are the people then we need to look after their welfare. So as I wait for my presentation to be shared, I just want to say that we have gained a lot in terms of coming together through a movement we call grassroots, where we engage elected leaders and uh, opinion leaders in advancing our agenda. Most likely, these are people who don't even know anything on health, but they have, you, you interest them because I am a voter. If I am living in Nairobi city, I go to my constituency, I look for my uh, member of parliament. They will say I'm doing this because I'm paid. But if I get an, a normal, a, a local resident to write a letter, to my elected leader in Nairobi city, most likely the leader will listen because what happens in the grassroots movement is that we engage like 30 advocates um, to ensure that they write the same uh, letter with their own handwriting. It's nothing typed, it's nothing uh, fancy fancy. We just do it handwriting on a full scap and we are able to push for agenda. So you could go to slide number five. So, but what is important, poll number two has shown uh, the many things encompassing issues of gender equality and decent work for nurses. But we must also agree that the resources available to put in all these components is not enough, despite the fact that uh, this, um, this aspect that are being brought out are important. So there's need to prioritize. I know we have engaged to supporting the advocacy on nurses because um, when COVID happened, all or ma majority of the healthcare workers were taken to the COVID-19 response. So what happened in the TB, we wouldn't have um, the people reviewed, wouldn't have drugs, uh, drugs uh, dispensed the way they were dispensed. And we came out and said, the nurses are complaining of insurance. As uh, my colleague from Kenya said, most of them were getting admitted. They don't have any insurance. It is an issue of fundraising from friends. So you can imagine the same cohort fundraising for the same category of people who are doing humanitarian work important for the country. And what we did then was to support them and do a press treatment uh, to the Minister for Health. And then because there was the fourth summit on COVID, we wrote to the president of the Republic of Kenya. We said, healthcare workers are there to support Kenyans. As a consumer of the services um, at the healthcare level, we need the government to ensure NHIF National Health Insurance Fund for nurses is catered for. And I'm happy to say that the next day, the Minister for Health came and said, we are going to ensure that nurses are provided with NHIF. Of course, the other request was the rapid test, which also was very expensive. It was $10. No, it was actually $100. And we said, uh, we want to test, but how many Kenyans can afford it? Even the nurses who want to test it, if it's not free, especially if they are in the private healthcare center, then we are not going to go far in terms of COVID-19. And I'm happy to say through the advocacy, we were able to bring down the cost to $20. It's still expensive, but at least most people can afford it now. So we have used uh, members of parliament. Uh, most of them don't know anything on health, but they are very vocal and passionate on human issues. And uh, we have made, with time we have created a rapport with them, we made them our champions. Then we engage grassroots. Our grassroots are not very educated. They, they're just people who live in a, in a locality and have a common issue that they need to advocate for. And the other strategy that we've really used very well is social media. Where I'm saying social media is because internet has been there for 20 years now in Africa and 
Kenya's coverage is at 80%. So anybody can access Twitter, WhatsApp, SMS, and you're able to push forward your agenda very easily as a nurse. One of the things when we tried pushing for the wages for medical people, medical personnel, the doctors and nurses, a very senior person from the presidential delivery unit told me they are trying to push for their salary. If only they would be pushing for commodities at the health facility. And so I met the national union uh, leadership and told them, this is the feeling of the government. If you go on that way, you will not succeed much. It is something they need, but for advocacy, we need also to focus on one thing, have it, uh, we win it, then we come back. Otherwise, we put so many things, uh, there are roads to be built, there are schools to be built. We are in a developing countries, we are having loans. I think we will not achieve much. So I want to say that we have to use many, um, many forms of engaging our legislators. We don't use confrontation for us. And I've seen it work because even when members of parliament have a challenge, they'll tell us, we are seeing this issue. Where is the data? So for us, we also go down and get them the data, uh, tell them this is a challenge, uh, what we can, you, you can help us is A, B, and C. Then they even not tell you whether this is possible. But the other important thing, if you're looking for money, you must ensure you align yourself with the budget, nas the national budget process. Because if the budget is read by June, do not come do your advocacy in July, there'll be no money. You have to start your advocacy in February and say we want PPs, we want commodities, we want NHIF for our staff, and then ensure that it's there. How you, there was an issue which is very important. Somebody said you need to monitor. How will you monitor that you're succeeding in advocacy? Because this is very fluid. You may do advocacy and not know how to monitor. For us, we use the Hansard, where we go back to the, it's an online platform. You go back on a certain day, you check whether the agenda was raised on the floor of the house, and then you are able to see that actually you have succeeded in your advocacy and action has been taken. I want to appreciate that through engagement of uh, champions in parliament, in 2014, Kenya had stock out for TB drugs. It's the members of parliament who raised it on the floor of the house. And we were able to borrow it from a very small country called Malawi. A Kenya, Kenya, which is big, was able to borrow it from Malawi and were able to ensure we have TB drugs for TB patients. So that is what I want to do. Uh, I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't just focus on getting nurses. Look for allies, even communities, beneficiaries of your services, because we feel it. When the nurses are on the street, we feel it. And we appreciate, we also appreciate the work the nurses do. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rahav. I think that was a really interesting reflection uh, from an uh, advocacy practitioner who's not in nursing per se, uh, but is very much in the health field. So I think that you're bringing an interesting perspective here about how nurses can find allies in the community to help raise their issues, including with parliamentarians. Would you like to show a few of your slides? Because I think that the photos tell part of the story. You were mentioning asking people to write letters, and I think you have a nice photo of uh, uh, showing the um, showing someone uh, involved in one of your advocacy uh, uh, sessions. Are we uh, are we able to uh, are we able to show uh, some of her slides? I'll do yeah. Thank you. Okay. So you can go to slide number eight. Okay, the next one. Yes, thank you. You can see this is a handwritten, uh, yeah, handwritten uh, letter by a grassroots advocate. It's nothing fancy, but it's clear to the point. At this time, in 2015, we didn't have TB drugs for children in, can in, in the country. What we used to have were the big um, capsules where a, a, a guardian of a TB, a child with TB would be split and given to a child. It's very cumbersome, some particles fall off, a uh, default rate was also high. And because this letter was actually written by a child with the consent of the guardian, we were able now to get um, 
the next year, the Minister for Health at that time launched the new pediatric TB drugs for the country, the first time ever, of course, with support from Initaid. So we don't need fancy things. We need to communicate, we need to be clear, and then we need to have so many people do the same thing at the same time, then we're able to meet our, our goal. I think we can go forward and see the letter, the photo with the member of parliament. This is just a photo of civil society, this one. This is Honorable Mule, who's been a very uh, passionate uh, champion for us on anything on health, but specifically for TB. TB. So at some point, we will bring them together. Do not be dis uh, discouraged if you find there are only four or five members of parliament. That is still good enough. The minute you get one champion, you get to enlighten them on an issue. You have them do a statement of commitment. They sign on and they say, we will commit to ensuring the nurses have decent work, that they have the necessary equipment, commodities available at the healthcare facility. So it is important when they do this because they, they, they truly keep their word, keep their word, especially for healthcare because it has a lot of money. They keep their words, but you also need to ensure we also uh, continuously engage them. And I want to say that through Honorable Mule, we have able to push the budget from TB from zero Kenya shillings to 10 million Kenya shillings, which I think now in the next budget will be more. But those are just some of the few uh, success stories we have had engaging members of parliament. I think next you can just pass through and just see the Twitter chats, uh, which is done. Yeah, that's how you monitor. That's a report from Hansard. Next. Yeah, so just a Twitter chat, you have everybody in and the top there is a letter from the ministry responding to an issue we have. So I think that is it. And of course, engage the media because what is not reported has did not happen. Thank you. Okay, this is really important experience that you've had engaging the, the media, as you just said. Uh, and, and also using uh, social media, engaging with the parliament parliamentarians, Honorable Mule, I've had the pleasure to meet myself, and, and he's really quite a, a leader in, in health. And so you found someone there who will be a champion uh, for your issues. Um, so this is an opportunity to work with parliamentarians like this once you can identify them and then bring on like-minded uh, politicians to work with them. So I think this is a really fascinating experience. Uh, I wanna open up uh, the floor for some questions uh, now, because I know we have quite a number of people on the line who've got some uh, fascinating questions uh, to pose. I want to see if we have. Do we have? Um, uh, do we have uh, Haruma Safeli uh, on the line from uh, Tanzania? Because I know that she had a a question. Is she able to contribute that into the chat? All right, what I'm gonna do is ask those of you who have questions to use the raise hand function. So if you go down at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, you'll see participants, you'll see Q&A, you'll see chat, you'll see share screen. You should see something that says raise hand. Looks like you'll see a little, okay. We've got a couple of raised hands. Let's see some more hands. Who has some questions? David, there is a question in the chat box. Okay, I can't really see that, unfortunately. Okay, let, let me read it. Okay. I think it's just for anybody. It says women have less than 25% of senior management positions in the organizational structure. Do you believe that mandatory representation proportion, such as 50% of women, could be an effective strategy to compensate for gender discrimination? That's the question. And I, I think I want to answer that one. Um, yeah, but it will be it, it will be a universal answer in the sense that 
My having been a, a regional director for Eastern and Southern Africa, I have seen where in all the countries of Eastern and Southern Africa, actually women are more literate than men. And fact, they are in positions, but sometimes they need to skip and get that position. So that yes, I believe that in some countries you may have to have that mandatory, but in others, it is obvious that then the, the woman who's qualified should go in. But we do have enough qualified women who can be able to take up those positions. Yeah. That's really Thank great. Thank you. And I thought I saw that uh, did uh, did Constance also have a question? Did I see a raised hand there? I think she had a, an answer, David. Oh, no I question. see. Okay. No question. Kenny, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Well, I mean, I think that <clears throat> I don't know about the mandatory, but but quotas have been very effective um, in several countries. Um, uh, in, in increasing the number of, of women in positions. And I think one of the issues is that women um, suffer, nurses suffer such time poverty um, that, it, that even though the, the positions may be open, they may not be able to, to take, take up those positions. They may not have time to take up senior management positions. Um, and so having that sort of mandatory aspect sort of protects those positions of leadership. Otherwise, other people may, may take those, those, uh, those positions. But I, I think also what I wrote here was having quotas, having some sort of vision of equal representation um, on decision-making bodies is simply one way of combating this issue we've been talking about, the glass ceiling, you know, vertical segregation, which in itself is a form of discrimination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me uh, see if there are any more, any additional questions from the from the, our audience. You can add it into the chat, or you can add it into Q and A, or raise your hand. Okay, we'll come back to the question uh, questions while while you're thinking about questions to ask. But I'm going to turn back to Rahab. Rahab, as you look at um, some of the experiences that the nurses have related uh, during the panel earlier. Uh, if we think particularly about Latitia and some of her experiences in Madrid uh, in terms of getting uh, nurses issues onto the agenda, uh, or you look at the experience uh, that uh, uh, Zipora related uh, from Kenya, what lessons do you think that uh, your experience uh, can, can tell us about what would be some ways that they, they might address issues that they've been uh, confronting? Uh, whether it's, as you saw from the poll, uh, maternity leave was a, a really critical issue for a number of people in our audience. Uh, how would you bring some of the strategies that you talked about in your presentation to bear on an issue like that or on other issues of violence? Uh, and harassment, that was another issue uh, that was raised. Uh, is that something that you could take to the politicians in the same way that you mentioned regarding uh, TB drugs? Yes, thank you, David. I think those are very key um, aspects on looking at uh, nurses, uh, <clears throat> nurses welfare. And I want to look at the violence, sexual violence, like in Kenya, we have a law that uh, we call it the Sexual Offences Act 2016. 2016, yes. And what it says is violence is violence, irrespective of where it happens. So if we have a national uh, law that governs all citizens, whether you're male, female, or whatever sector you're working in, I think nurses are covered. And we have seen it work in such that uh, we have seen people who have been laid off because of maternity issues, and they have gotten compensated from their, their, their former employers. So I think for us is to, when you see it's an area that is a bit broad, like sexual offenses, let's not narrow it down to the, the specific category of nurses, but let's broaden it. We also have very good gender activists uh, in Africa. I know like Kenya, we are not so badly off, 
and of course engaging members of parliament because you need somebody to bring that bill in the floor at the floor of the house so engaging members of parliament for this one i would say you need a woman because uh, men will be like why should i do this and blah, blah. so you want a woman to push your agenda women parliamentarians are very passionate about human rights issues about women and child uh, welfare <clears throat> the other thing is you need to work with the ministry of gender and women it can be called uh, different names in different countries so that they are able to show to show you where that law will lie uh, you also want to because at the end of the day even if a member of parliament brings it to the floor of the house the respective minister will be consulted so you want to be <clears throat> at the at the same level with them because most of them is uh, is usually what you call money bills money bills meaning there's a bill that needs structures to be put in place and so forth and so forth so you need to do a lot of advocacy a lobbying if you need to and ensure but you need one champion one who will believe in your agenda uh <clears throat> the other one uh i think is the same but also focus on uh, whether you want it short term or long term some advocacy will take time like making a law will take two years depending some countries are not open democracies even in kenya where we are more democratic things sometimes don't work so depending on the environment in your country, depending whether it's an election year, things don't get done in Africa in an election year. So do, don't try to push a bill uh, during an election year or just one year to push it before so that you have enough time to do the back and forth uh, to ensure that you also support the membership of the nurses. Uh, maternity also is covered under the Labor Act. Uh, the employment so every I, I, and i know in kenya <clears throat> most employers are there to that whether you're in the construction industry whether in your private sector uh, if you if if you see clearly that an employer has discriminated you on issues of maternity the penalties are usually so high and uh, most employers may like, want to circumvent but if you have your facts right the penalties are high so most of them really just try to avoid it to avoid it so ensure that uh, the agenda is backed by law and then within the nursing council ensure that now this is also implemented for men even in kenya we have two weeks paternity leave which is good whether the men use it for maternity to support their women or their partners is something but they are given two weeks paternity leave yes thank you thank you thank you so much Rahab. it's uh, it's really good to hear your reflections on this I'm gonna open it up one more time to the audience. Any questions that you would like to pose, put in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, well, we can, uh, we'll, we'll be looking out for your questions on, on Facebook. Uh, before we um, conclude, I've got a couple of things I wanna do. And, and also I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Barbara for some concluding comments. Um, as you uh, as you look at at your lobby, I really want to recommend the uh, Nursing Now uh, toolkit. Be sure to check that out. I don't know if we can add in a link into the, uh, the chat, uh, but uh, if if you look particularly on the section that's called Plan Your Lobby, Plan Your Lobby. There's some basic steps there, and I think that they're really worth uh, looking at. So number one, you're going to define the problem. What is the problem? Is it maternity leave? Is it sexual harassment? Build your case for change. As Dr. Tlu was mentioning, you need evidence. You need some data. And that's, Rahab mentioned that as well. There you'll see in the chat, a link to the uh, Mass Lobby Toolkit. Step number two, choose the target. Who do you need to persuade to deliver to you what you want? Uh, and, and how are you going to influence them? Is it the parliamentarians that you need to reach? Is it the Minister of Health? Is it the director of your hospital or your clinic? Uh, is it the uh, nursing council? Uh, who do you need? Number three, and this is really important, find your allies. And Zipporah mentioned that. I think that's a, a theme that Rahab really mentioned too. And there, it's not only, only the nurses, obviously the nurses you need to work with, find other nurses that you can work with, but who can be your ally in the community? 
that's something that Rahab really emphasized in her presentation. Uh, who are your allies in government? Um, number four, call for change. That's an important step, uh, obviously. And there, we heard a lot of emphasis on using the media and using social media. Number five, uh, tell us about your Nurses Together campaign. Be in touch with uh, Nursing Now. Uh, Barbara is going to come back to, to some of those themes and the important letter uh, that she is asking all of us uh, to deliver to ministries of health. A really important call to action that we're going to hear about. And before we get there, though, I want to go through each speaker and ask if you could share one piece of advice to nurses as they start out being advocates. Uh, you may have a nurse on the, on the line here who is not engaged in advocacy so far. Uh, and is looking at a, a, a challenging uh, issue to bring uh, to the government or to bring to uh, the uh, medical uh, establishment in her country, what, what advice can you share? If I could start out with uh, Zipporah, what, what are some concluding uh, remarks that you could make? Um, thank you, David. I think um, I would love to say two things. The first one is that nurses should remain persistent, never give up. I think um, the system, the way it's uh, conjured, particularly for young nurses, there may not be a necessary, um, rather like a well-defined structure to be engaged in advocacy and leadership. Um, so the first thing is to know that and to be aware that there are those challenges and not to give up because there's potential to do so much more. And I think the other one um, is to just encourage them to find people who are like-minded. I think that is where we began and the journey gets easier. Um, and I always insist that, you know, a voice from a community may be louder than when it comes from an individual person. So if you can find people who share the same values, share the same interests, who are like-minded to you, then move with them. And I think the results will be much um, greater um, and will be achieved even more faster. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zipporah. Some really important advice. Don't give up. Be persistent. Find your allies and like-minded people who can work with you and uh, support you. Really important advice there. Now, uh, Dr. Tlu, if I could turn the floor over to you. Any advice that you would want to share as we conclude? Right. For me, it's really three things. The first one is that knowledge is power, but evidence is more powerful. So get that data. The second is to tell the nurses that there is no glass ceiling, but a bunch of men's bodies that just need to be moved. So advocate and move those bodies and we will get there. And the last one to say, it is great to have a champion as a member of parliament, but it is even better if you are the champion yourself because in the ultimate, Health is a political choice. So get in there, you know, don't worry, make, make sure that you have allies, but get in there, stand for that political office because you are going to stand for something. And I end with the story of Adam and Eve that I usually tell people, you know, my, my, my mentees and say to them, look, when Adam was asked by God, what have you done? You know, after they ate whatever they ate, Instead of Adam defending anybody, or he could have given any excuse. He said, the woman that you made, gave me, made me do it. To say to the, to the women out there that men never spoke for us then, they never will. You want to speak for us, get in there and do the thing. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Get in there and raise your voice. Really important. That's right. Uh, comments there. And now I'm going to ask uh, Leticia Bernuez from uh, Nursing in Madrid uh, to offer some uh, concluding advice. Yeah, so just trust yourself and trust the nursing knowledge and the nursing value that we have. I mean, you don't need to be in a leader position to do advocacy. You don't need to be a decision maker already. Clinical nurses know a lot about what needs to be changed. So just go for it. I think that's really important advice that advocacy is not for the experts. It's for you and you have the knowledge to bring to bear. You already know uh, what you need to know uh, and have the uh, experience to bring to this struggle. Thank you so much, Leticia. I think that's a really important comment. Lemlem Besa, our uh, nurse practitioner and professor 
from Ethiopia. Can you offer some uh, concluding uh, advice? Yeah, I I would share uh, all the all the information has been said before. So keep asking, know what you ask, and be teamed, teamwork, and uh, never look back. Thank you for that. Uh, really important. And Rahab Mwaniki, our advocacy manager at Kanko in Kenya. What is, what's some concluding advice that you would offer? So I just have two points. The, the late Professor Wangari Mathai, Nobel laureate, once said, one used to give the story of the hummingbird, the bird that would, all, when the, all the animals ran away from a fire in the forest, is the one that would go and pick water and drop. So as nurses, I want to encourage you, you don't have to look for the numbers so that you do something together, but look at the story of the hummingbird. Are you the hummingbird that is going to save and uh, protect the nursing movement? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. What contribution are we going to put uh, for the benefits of the other nurses at the younger generation and the people who are already in the profession? The next one is just to say that advocacy is about numbers the strength in numbers. You cannot do advocacy when you're alone. You can be the leader, but you need many people to support you. Thank you. Some really important points. And I've been, uh, it's been an honor to be here to support uh, voices on this webinar. Uh, I wanna just uh, ask one favor of everyone in the audience to submit a video to our video campaign. Just hold up your phone and say, this is what I want. This is what I need as a nurse you're gonna find uh, information about how to do that on our website and in the chat, look at the chat bar because Carol has posted a link to the video campaign. We have a lot of men who've contributed their videos, thank you, uh, but we need some women. So come on women, contribute your videos. Remember, it doesn't have to be, uh, this, is not, uh, you're not, this is not the Oscars competition. It's really just tell us what you think and what you need because that's going to be something we can use to inspire politicians uh, to do more. So as we uh, conclude now, it's been a, a great pleasure to be with, uh, with all of you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Stilwell, uh, who's gonna uh, close our webinar for the day and, and remind you about a really important piece of action that she has for you all. David, thank you so much. And thank you for this great chairing of uh, what's been an incredibly rich session for all of us um, this afternoon, really wonderful to have this on the eve of World Health Day, when we should all be thinking about how we're going to advocate, not only for nurses, but for the people we look after for good health around the world. So I've been uh, listening to everything that's been said and thinking about what am I taking away from this rich, rich picture of advocacy. And I'll share with you some of the things that I've heard. It's gonna be different for everybody, isn't it? But um, here's the things I've heard. So from Zipporah, again, as always I have when I listen to young nurses, I am inspired um, by the way they become engaged and how she, uh, with her colleagues, shows the way in how to bring about change and how brave that is. Um, I think of myself as a, a young nurse I think I was scared of everything and I'm not sure I would have raised my voice about anything. And I'm just so in awe of young people these days who are so much more sorted out and can use social media for advocacy. Um, and that's a lesson I've learned as executive director of nursing now. Social media is so important. Um, so don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to use those contacts on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. That's the way you build a social movement. So well done, Zipporah, and all your colleagues in Kenya. I always learn something from Sheila, my sister, uh, my hero. Run for office, says Sheila, and don't rely on the men. Just push them out of the way on the glass ceiling and get up there instead. And boy, oh boy, that's what Sheila has done. If ever there was a role model, it's Sheila. So let's be like Sheila. Let's run for political office. Let's get our voice heard. Yes, we can. And nurses are so reluctant to get involved um, 
in politics. And yet we are a great voice for people. We're a great voice for standing up for good health and standing up for people who don't have it. And Sheila has been an amazing example of that um, with her work on AIDS and HIV in Africa. And it continues with other diseases too. And, uh, and for nursing. So Sheila, thank you for all you've done and thank you for being such a wonderful role model. Letitia, how could I ever forget? Be persistent. You have your evidence and you know why you're doing it. My goodness, isn't that true? And find somebody to work with, work with your organization. And we heard that message the other day too from Billy Rosa who was doing a masterclass on advocacy, he said the same thing. He said, work with your organization, work with a group, and that will make you stronger. Um, and that's wonderful advice, Letitia. Be persistent. Don't give up at the first hurdle. And it's so hard sometimes, isn't it, to just you know fall down seven times, stand up eight. But we can do it. Yes, we can. Be persistent. Thank you, Letitia. From Lemlen, I heard a story that is very familiar to me and I think to many others of you. It's about having a career path, isn't it? For those skills, the advanced practice skills that we learn and feeling valued for those skills too. Um, and you know, having nowhere to go when you've studied for a master's degree is so demotivating. Um, and we are so slow to learn this lesson in nursing. So for those of you listening in management, this is a great call to action. Let's find ways of having a career path for nursing that's valued and rewarded. That's all part of decent work. Rahab has given us some amazing advice. Rahab, I really, um, uh, so in awe of your skills in advocacy, skills that we could all be learning. One phrase you used that stood out for me was, what is not reported did not happen. And we need to learn that as nurses. We need to learn to engage with the media. They don't want the everyday story. And my goodness, nurses have been in the news, haven't they, during COVID. But as they say on the Frontline Health Workers campaign, applause is not enough. We have to move beyond that, beyond the applause, to the real stories of nursing, which are what, what we do every day, and that is not often not rewarded and not valued. And so we need to be much, much better at getting those stories out there into the media. One word of advice we had from, um, uh, some of our colleagues in Scotland here in the UK was to really engage local newspapers and local television. They love stories. So don't be afraid to go out there and share your story. Share your letter to the prime minister or to the health minister. The links to the letter are on the website. Um, go and find the letter fill in your details, fill in your ask and send it to your minister, but send it to the newspaper too, because what is not reported didn't happen. So make sure your local paper has it or turn it into a letter to your paper as well, so that your stories, your asks for decent investment in nursing are getting out there. Do use our mass lobby toolkit. Do make a video for frontline health workers. This is our moment. You've heard me say this once and you will hear me say it now. If we don't take advantage of this moment at the end of the pandemic when we have been so visible and when everywhere is trying to rebuild health systems for health for universal health coverage for achieving the SDGs, if we don't take advantage of this moment, we will not have another moment like it. We will not have another opportunity like this one for decades. Take advantage of this moment, get that letter out there, and please post us a picture 
of you doing it. Share it on social media so we all know what, what you're doing and where you're doing it. Thank you all so much for participating. There's links to all kinds of things in the chat. Make sure you've copied them. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. And thanks to our panelists and speakers. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Ooh.